This is Beyond the Big Screen Podcast with your host, Steve Guerra. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Big Screen Podcast. We are a member of the Parthenon Podcast Network. Of course, a big thanks goes out to our frequent guest, Chris. You can support Beyond the Big Screen on Patreon and Subscribestar. By joining on Patreon and Subscribestar, you're becoming a part of the team. You help keep Beyond the Big Screen going and get many great benefits. You can get books, early released episodes, ad-free episodes, and even, like I said, even become a part of the team. Go over to patreon.com forward slash beyond the big screen or subscribestar.com forward slash beyond the big screen to learn more. Another really great way to support Beyond the Big screen is to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcast or your podcatcher of choice. These reviews really help me know what you think of the show and help other people learn about Beyond the Big Screen. More about the Parthenon Podcast Network can be found at ParthenonPodcast.com. You can learn more about Beyond the Big Screen, great movies and stories so great they should be movies on various social media platforms by searching for A2Z History. Links to all of this and more can be found at BeyondTheBigScreen.com. I thank you for joining me again, Beyond the Big Screen. Welcome back to Beyond the Big Screen. We're joined again by Chris, um, and you'll know Chris from Prometheus. But today we're going to delve in in a really similar way to another 80s sci-fi movie, RoboCop, and not just RoboCop 1, RoboCop 2. We're going to look at what did this movie, what were some of the big ideas and concepts that this movie was trying to really dig into and talk about so it's really much more than an action movie it's it's really is trying to in an 80s sci-fi kind of way tap into some really interesting and complicated social and technological issues so chris how are you doing doing quite well myself um yeah ro- like uh, robocop is uh it's just a, it's a movie i grew up with all the time it's um Pretty much any time I get sick, it's the first thing I throw on is RoboCop. If I get I'll order a pizza or something, and just watch RoboCop until I get better in the morning, it's just something I've watched it so many times. I just think it's it's brilliant. Um, but the basic premise of RoboCop, I guess I should lay this out for the audience, is so Detroit is falling apart basically, and this is for both movies, RoboCop and RoboCop uh, Two. Detroit is falling apart. Uh, the criminals essentially are running the streets um, and the cops are being uh, killed daily, right? They seem to, uh, the police force seems to be really ineffective at uh, trying to control the uh, criminality that's essentially running uh, Detroit. Uh, I think the reason they picked Detroit is, well, because it's kind of what happened to Detroit. It's kind of what's going on in Detroit now right um that's just my personal opinion i think i don't i don't know for sure if that was the reason the director picked the picked the detroit but that's what i think um but in the backdrop of all of it and this is what makes kind of like robocop stand out from your regular you know uh dystopian sci-fi action movie from the 80s you have a company called omni consumer products and throughout the movie and i for for our purposes we're just going to call it ocp now, OCP is a private corporation. Think like a uh, place like Amazon or Google, one of these, you know, big mega corporations, Lockheed Martin. They have a lot of different divisions that they're in, involved in a lot of different things. Yeah. Um, they, from you find out in the, pretty quickly, there's essentially they run the police force in Detroit. A privately owned corporation is running the police force in Detroit because as you'll find later in the second movie, Detroit has no money. They can't pay. <laughs> they can't pay their own police force. So basically they had to sell it off to Omni consumer products who, you know, which is interesting because, you know, you wouldn't think like, Oh, the police force is, uh, you know, something that you can run for profit, but obviously Omni consumer products has found a way to run it for profit. Right. We find, uh, so we see later, uh, I, our main character, Alex Murphy, uh, is being transferred to Detroit and 
his first day in the job with his partner, Lewis, who was a female police officer. So I guess that was, I guess that was pretty progressive at the time. I don't know. Paul Verhoeven, who's the director of the Robocop movie, he always has done those types of things in his movies. He's a, he also directed Starship Troopers. He did the movie Basic Instinct. He did the movie Total Recall. He's always done like these, I don't know how to describe it. He's always kind of done like this. Uh, he's always had this thing for almost kind of like this, gender genderless society i guess is the sense i can think of where like uh not genderless like um i don't know like the females are just in the arm like in the police force just like the males are and like in the army and they're doing all the same things right yeah i would say at that time it was kind of it wasn't the first batch of women who were really integrated into the police department but that probably was kind of the cutting edge of it he, it's much more at it's much more like clear in starship troopers yeah murphy is unfortunately brutally killed on his first day of the job also um and it's honestly probably one of the most graphic like death scenes in 80s action and from my under from my reading apparently it was supposed to be worse but the studio is just like no that's going too far so i can only imagine i can only imagine what it looked like originally so Alex Murphy is uh, killed and he gets he basically they harvest what's left of his body, which is pretty much what they want is his brain. And they use him for what they call the 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 Robocop program, which is this program of merging um, the human being with this machine to create like this like super cop that doesn't have the hangups of like total AI. So it can think for itself to a certain degree, but it's still like, it can be kind of programmed like a machine. It's this weird like hybrid, right? And OCP, you know, makes the Robocop and, you know, it's a smash success. He goes around, starts, you know, taking care of business and killing all the, uh, the criminals in the second one. Whereas like, whereas Detroit is kind of like a, failing state in the first one and the second one is a completely failed state where literally the there's a drug cult ran by a guy named kane who is supposed to like, he, the guy who plays kane kind of plays him up like like if charles manson had like like actual like large like ran a drug cartel uh he has a, <laughs> he has a drug uh called nuke which is apparently the the most addictive drug in the world. It, they, the guy playing Kane, this is the one of the main, one of the better characters I thought in that movie because I, I like the way he played him. He kind of reminded me of, I'm trying to think of the guy's name who did the, uh, the uh, who was uh, like the leader of the LSD movie. Oh yeah, Timothy Leary. Yeah, where he thought like Kane thinks he's like freeing people's minds to new experiences and giving them paradise. Um, but obviously it's doing the exact opposite. You know, the cops are addicted to nuke. Uh, you'll find, you see that later in the movie, the whole, the whole city is just gone to crap. Basically it's, there's no, it's, it's so bad that like, and this is one of the funnier parts of the second one, which it makes it darker in a lot of ways The one of the main drug lords, he's like the second hand man is, is a 12 year old kid. <laughs> you can't help but laugh. You know, like could I couldn't only imagine like that movie getting made uh that big big nowadays. Yeah, but it's a 12-year-old kid. Um, and then you find out that you find out later in the movie that from the mayor that Detroit has officially gone bankrupt. And I think I mean of two movies that um in that day and age in the 80s, they really did tie together really well. I think that you know they did carry through. I wonder, and I, I mean, they did, I read some things about it, but what was RoboCop supposed to represent? Like, obviously, like on the surface level, he's like the guy who just comes in and he's going to be the real cop. And the, you get like all these motifs of like the uh, old West sheriff who's just going to clean up the town, but there is no cleaning up this town. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's, I think it's like a last, I think it's like, it's a combination of like a propaganda tool by OCP and it, it shows that they're trying to do something right. Uh, I mean, if you have like a Robocop shows up and he starts like killing, he starts like, you know, killing the bad guys and starts cleaning the streets up. It's in, and it's just like, um, 
part of it too is it's like it's also a test run right because like what you find out what you find out in the movie is like the ocp is having a hard time with the cops like the cops want to go on strike they don't seem to be doing a very good job so they're testing out these like ai like robotic cops that they have essentially can replace the the cops with when they finally get delta city right but if you're like a if you're the old man running ocp you know and a guy like robocop comes out and he's got like you know knight in shining armor and he's killing all the bad guys and the kids love him it's a great propaganda even though it's really not like you pointed out it's not going to really do anything right but it looks good yeah and i think that the filmmakers and uh the audience like in the 80s that's what we wanted to see was the knight in shining armor like just going in willy-nilly killing the the bad guys and i think that um obviously like nowadays that's a lot more problematic that that approach and like that's something that it would definitely not resonate with an audience today but i think that the thing that they were maybe trying to get at and like the technology hadn't gone so far is that policing is difficult and you need the right type of person you can't just have a robot doing it because it's it law enforcement requires somebody who has some judgment and knows when to push far enough but not push too hard and in a failed and and especially in this failed detroit you have police that are going on a strike you have police who are on the drug you have police that don't care and the ones who do care are getting killed in the streets in the second one it was brought up like what made alex murphy like a good robocop and somebody brought up it's like well you know he's from a he's from a devout irish catholic family with a strong sense of duty you know like it's like a very it couldn't just be when they were trying to come up the second robocop they were just trying to different cops brains and none of it was working right because you need a very particular person to be like a good cop like you pointed out right um yeah and it, like in the in the first one i find like i found like a lot of the uh like the really good stuff to me like in terms of like the commentary or what have you that's going on in the first rule cop is like in the first like opening like boardroom meeting and like you find out like that ocp made its money investing in what as uh nick jones nick jones points out like what was considered like basically non-profit endeavors and he lists hospitals prisons space exploration that's like well the prisons yeah space exploration yeah you know hospital things kind of like up for a debate but i mean that's kind of what's going on right now is it not i mean tesla is doing it is is tesla and now uh amazon are doing space exploration for profit and the prison thing is you know that's been debated endlessly like it should prisons be privately ran um and it but it does kind of show you like this this and we were talking about this earlier today but like this kind of like push to like pri privatization of like more and more stuff uh industries things that were typically considered like under the preview of like i don't know maybe local government state government provincial government federal government but it wasn't really something that was considered like that you would offshore to like private industry right and yeah that's kind of like so that's how OCP made its money was doing was like doing stuff like, you know, buying the police force of Detroit and trying to run it at a profit, which it seems so crazy. But I don't think it's I don't think it's that far fetched. Like, I think in 30 years, 40 years, we might be talking about stuff like that, you know? Well, in a lot of places where the police force is ineffective, people hire private security and that's kind of like the maybe not the next step but it's not too many steps from the the police force is ineffective the public safety is ineffective so let's bring in a a new police force that's privatized yeah like yeah like a community or something buying like paying for a private police force and then a private corporation seeing an opportunity being like well, man, there's money to be made here. Why don't we provide the police force for them? Um, I don't think it's, I don't think it seemed like that crazy of an idea. I think it's kind of going in that direction. 
I think it's a lot crazier in 1989 to 1992 than it would definitely be considered today. Yeah, well, that's that's the craziest thing is like when he's talking about like privatization of like space of uh, prisons and <laughs> like uh, space exploration for money. You get people when Robocop was made, it was made in yeah eighty seven and ninety two was the second one. Nobody was thinking like this was something that was going on. Like I don't, I don't if I could be mistaken, but I don't think prisons started getting privatized until like the late nineties, right? Yeah, maybe the sometime in the nineties for sure. Yeah, uh, or that like a private company would be like le- leading the innovation and in space exploration for profit. Like it's in eighty seven, people would have just looked at you and thought like, "Oh, you're crazy." But you know, like this movie showed like kind of the direction that it was all going in, uh, and that's like the thing that's always struck me about this film. That's what makes it so brilliant is the fact that it was like. 30 years ahead of everybody else for like what people typically just consider like a silly kind of be science fiction movie with a guy in a, you know, in a metal suit, but they were pretty head like bang on with their predictions. There was a weird little factoid I stumbled upon in the, in RoboCop two, the main drug Lord was a 12 year old kid. And I think that they had tapped into, I don't have anything that completely verifies this, but it must be in 1987, they arrested, I think he was 17 at that time, but his name was Rick Warsha or Warshi. And a movie was made about him in 2018, starting starring Matthew McConaughey called White Boy Rick. And that's about a kid who actually lived in, Detroit in the 80s and in the 70s, who was a drug lord. And he was like in his early teens and his dad had been a drug lord and set this kid up. I think that that's ex- that was about that time that that story had really broken. And I think they were tapping into that. Yeah, I think that they must have. And that, I think that's kind of a cool connection to make. And I bet it happened in Detroit. I've never heard of that before. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I always thought it was like them just kind of showing how messed up Detroit is, is like the fact that like 12 year olds are drug lords in this in Detroit right now, you know? Um, yeah. That like, what was another thing that I would like, I always, I'd liked about the first one was like Ed, o, uh, Ed 209, who's this, he's this giant, like he's supposed to be, he was supposed to be the original Robocop, I guess. And he's like this giant robot that's got these two big machine guns on each, uh, on for each of his arms or what have you. And it, like, it looks really cool when you first see it. Cause like they do the, the props that they built look really cool. And the animatronics that they use when it's moving look, uh, are really well done. Um, so when he gets introduced every, if uh, everyone's like kind of wowed, like, Oh my God, this thing looks amazing. looks amazing. And, one of they he tells one of the uh, I guess he's like some intern at OCP or what have you to like you know point a gun at him you know just to show how it works or what have you and obviously clearly the thing malfunctions right and he he honestly must shoot this guy how many like a hundred a hundred million times or what have you it's like absolutely it's, just, it's absolutely hilarious so then there's this, just this great like great one line where I think it's Bob who is uh one of the main ocp characters he just screams out after this man has been shot like a million times like, will someone someone want to get a get a bloody paramedic <laughs> it's just like that's a part of the uh the robocop the uh uh movies is the uh just the wickedly black humor that's in in all of them um because I, I just say from personal experience or what have you, right? Like, so it's, it's a coping, it's a coping mechanism. Right. Um, but I just thought, yeah, I just thought that scene was like brilliant. And then you find out later that like Nick Jones didn't care. Like he knew that Ed 209 didn't work. He's like, it doesn't matter. We were going to sell parts to so and so we we're going to sell millions of dollars of parts to like China and like military contracts who cared if it worked. Right. And then it's, I mean, it's a really, it's really good, like, uh, 
commentary kind of like how a lot of the modern economy runs right it almost seems like no one seems to really care whether any of the stuff works or not you know like the corporate execs now like just openly talk about like hey we're not selling to the steak we're selling the sizzle you know which was like kind of like what people used to kind of like whisper like you know to themselves or what have you but they openly brag about this stuff now right you know look at cars like modern cars uh they don't like it's like oh it's got bluetooth it's got this it's got that you know like how long is the engine gonna run for you know oh, a couple of years um no one seems to really care that whether something functions or not which is i thought was a good commentary on like the the future of where the economy was going i don't know what do you think of that and now a brief word from our sponsors yeah i think that in so many of the I think that they nailed that in that the the actual RoboCop working was not important. And it's kind of like today with like Tesla, the selling of the solar panels is not how they make their money of, you know, the kind of like the good old American dream. You get up and you start a solar panel company and you get good at it and you sell solar panels. It's we're going to make solar panels so that we can get some subsidy for it and then we'll you know, make some money on arbitrage of this part, and then we'll sell uh, sell loans to buy back through the power company, like all these different things that the, the solar panel turns out to almost be like a uh, an afterthought of to just tie together all these different angles. And it's, I think it's a hard way for people to, as you know, I have a hard time thinking of it, that there's so many things built into, they're not just building a product to sell to you to, they make money. We have a product. There's so much other things built into it. People talk about like the gilded age or what have you, but if you look at like, like the old, like they used to, they call them like the robber barons or what have you. Like they were producing stuff well and it worked well. Like they were producing like an end product, like the railroads or uh, Rockefeller was the oil, right? Uh, like they were producing the stuff. They they produced a product and they produced it really well and it worked really well. Well, now it nowadays it's we're not even really producing products anymore. That's, <laughs> that's the thing, right? Like, even if you look at Amazon, which is like one of the richest companies is the richest company in the world. Um, if you really, what does Amazon do? They just, they ship products. They don't make anything though, really. There's so much money, the money. And I think that they, funny enough, I think they got into that in the movie is that so, so many things are built on the service that the product, there's no money in the product. It's in somehow servicing it. Uh, a Amazon selling services, M Microsoft, you don't buy your office anymore. You're buying a subscription to office 365. You know, so many things have gone to a subscription service and it's, um, it's a different, um, I think there's always been hints of things like that when there was an opportunity to kind of finagle things like in the, like you mentioned with the robber barons that, I mean, there's famous things where they would build the tracks like S's so that they could get more land right of way. And that, you know, they knew that they could build the track from this point to this point, And that would be the straightest point and use the least amount of rail and get you know eventually some farmers sheep or whatever from this point to this point but they wanted those right of ways and so th i think there's always people who if they have the opportunity to kind of flex and take a little bit extra they're going to do that and i think in today's economy things are so complicated and your average person doesn't it's too big for them to understand there's a lot more room for that sort of thing yeah yeah well I, and i think that's yeah i think well that's exactly what's what's going on right there's um there's so many different ways of like cheating now is the best is the best is the way i would describe it right where they're like you brought it with the robber barons like doing like building like s railways or what have you right like um there's so many like there's so many that's the game right is to find ways around like these these loopholes right and like you pointed out the product itself is, is 
whatever, right? It's it doesn't seem to really matter. Um, the other the other thing that I find is pretty cool about RoboCop too, though, is how it depicts the the criminals and the cr- corporate heads, and how essentially there's very little difference between the two of them. They're just in different fields of uh operations one of the criminals has like a great line where he says like you know no better way no better way to steal money than free enterprise right which is kind of like uh you know uh i don't know a little bit too nail on the head i guess like in terms of its critique of uh kind of what we were describing how the modern economy works now right um but that's the criminal saying, and OCP is saying says the exact same thing too, right? Uh, they're both saying the exact same thing. It's just the criminals are selling in the first movie they're selling coke, in the second movie they're selling nuke. Uh, OCP is uh, doing the same thing too. If you look at the tel- the the television shows that they're put on, which is something that you see in the movie, just how completely you know it, the the clips that you get, it's almost like it's designed to like make people brain dead yeah i think one thing though and like here's the big question is detroit gonna be worse off from delta city you know so delta city is that they're basically gonna tear down detroit and rebuild it and yeah it's ocp's town that kind of gets into this whole idea of corporate corporations becoming governments and it's been a thing that a lot of people have been talking about for a long time and i've always been skeptical of it but when you see that government and you know obviously the detroit and government has utterly and completely failed by robocop 2 it was completely bankrupt it it couldn't provide the most basic basic services that government is supposed to provide so are we supposed to just live with that or is what OCP is really doing? Is that a good thing at the end of the day? Yeah, that's a big, that's the big argument, right? Like it's, and it's something that solely has been going on. And this is the thing that, you know, Robocop, uh, both movies, they get it so well is this merger of government power and corporate power and how it increasingly becomes difficult to tell the difference between the two, like, which is which, right? And I think that's a lot of things that, that's what's kind of going on nowadays, right? And I think that's part of the the anxiety that a lot of uh, uh, people around the world are feeling because it's becoming increasingly difficult to tell the difference between the corporate power and the government power. It almost seems like they're merging together and they're working completely together, right? Um, which is, people have like all these like kind of like crazy notions about like what fascism is and what fascism isn't right. Like, you know, we've seen it on TV for the last four years, you know, so-and-so is this, so-and-so is this, but if you actually kind of read into what the fascists were said, like people like Benito Mussolini and, and uh, I'm trying to remember the uh, state philosopher or what have you, it was this idea of corporatism where like, the corporation and the state merge to become one, um, which is kind of what you're seeing happening in Robocop's world, right? It, it's like, it's, it show, it shows you in a sense of like how fascism comes about, right? And it starts with governments failing, right? And then the corporations with what's left of the government kind of merge together and become one and the same. Corporatism is more used because even though like fascism classically was the idea of the corporations and state like working together it's it's that obviously that term fascism has become so loaded and it's it's uh, hard to you know you'll ask uh, 50 people for a definition of fascism and you'll get 50 different responses but it really is it's corporatism and corporatism could be your you know your public private partnership of uh you know the company that builds the the light rail and provides the trains they kick in money to the project and you know the government kicks in projects these you know these but it you know it comes in in a lot of different ways of with banking and all these different services that 
you know, like you were saying with the privatized police department and a privatized jail system, and it, it becomes a fine line. Is the corporation purely doing this for profit or are we getting a better service out of the deal? Like, I mean, just look at the post office, the post office. I mean, technically the post office is like a private thing and that's a part of the government, at least in the U S I don't know how that translates, but UPS does delivering things from people's, you know, to people's houses a lot better than the post office does it. And would we be better to have UPS doing a parcel, you know, all deliveries, mail deliveries, especially, you know, now that technology's changed and people get a lot of letters, you know, like, I don't know about you, but if I get like two real things delivered by the postal service a, a week, that's a lot, you know, could that be done better in a different way? I think the, the, just the fine line is, and this is something like I kind of struggle with a bit is, um, what's the um like what is it what's it what's acceptable as um uh, something that you can privatize i, I remember i'll just speak from personal experience like, there was a huge uproar because they were going to privatize a uh, garbage pickup in toronto this was like a long time ago right and they started with half the city and eventually now it's all it's all a private company that does the garbage pickup in the city go i mean okay whatever that's not a big deal right like it's probably could be cheaper to do it that way but then we sold half of Hydro One, which is the big uh, power plant, like their big power source of power for most of Southern Ontario is, is Hydro One. They, our government decided that they would sell half of it to uh, private and uh, en- a uh, private entity. To me, that seems like that's it's going too far, right? That's something that the government should be having whether it be provincial or state or local, the government should be the one that's in control of certain industries like power. Why though? Why would you say that? Because the reason I say that is like, if you look at like, what's to stop like a private corporation, say eventually, you know, if you're going to sell half, then you can sell all of it. Right. Um, then the government loses its and the and by extension the people right lose control of pretty much one of the most important resources available which is you know power right it'd be like oc it'd be like if the like if the toronto toronto say the ontario government decided like oh we're going to privatize the police force you know there's certain things that like yes i would say like okay but then there's taking it as taking it too far, right? I guess you have to look at what is like what's the government's function, and it's to provide the a public good. So if the garbage company says, "Well, I'm not going to pick up from this neighborhood, or I'm not going to pick up, you know, these couple of houses," or with the power, with the same thing, like we're not going to provide power to this neighborhood because it's not cost effective or it's not profitable yeah then it's a different story but if they are providing a public good and they're providing it in common to everyone in a way that they've agreed that the government says they should be doing it because i mean to be quite honest police departments at times have had no go zones and haven't answered or they um or in a lot of cities police are only going to answer the the top priority calls they just don't have the the you know the, the manpower to answer anything more than the most top priority calls so if you're you know saw, thought you saw a prowler in your backyard or um your kitten stuck in the tree that's not going to ever get a response or your, you know, your car gets broken into, you're never going to get a response. The only thing they're responding to are like armed robberies in progress, that sort of thing. Then the government is really in a way not providing a good that they claim to have. But what if they suddenly, oh, we're going to have a private company that will come out and do an accident report or, you know, and as places have, they haven't, done it with private entities yet but is that something that doing things that are different and but getting a common good out of it isn't that worth something i would say like my argument would be like it becomes like a slippery slope right <laughs> where 
like say in the world of OCP and the mayor, the mayor of Detroit in the second movie, he does bring this up. He's, he goes to the old man. He goes, well, no one elected you. And the old man's response is, well, anyone can buy shares in OCP. And, you know, both me and you know, that's just whatever. That's just a talking point. Doesn't, you can buy a share. It doesn't mean anything. Um, but the argument is, well, you, to this particular mayor in Detroit, you haven't done a good job. I would say he didn't really have, you know, didn't really have a chance of, to succeed in the first place because things were already messed up. But that is like, it is an argument. Like it, nobody really knows how like Google really runs its business. Right. Um, but you know, we're all, you know, it controls, I believe it's like 98 or 99% of all search engines yet. There's no real oversight for it. Right. Um, so if it, it gets, starts getting to the point where like, you start privatizing everything, right? Um, there's no real, and the government takes a, has, you, the government starts having less and less say and less and less power over all these things. It's, you get to the point where like, you know, it could get in theory, like say like OCP, OCP ends up like controlling everything, right? And no one elected the old man. No one elected uh, Bob, no one elected Nick Jones. And there's no oversight for any of these guys at all, except for, you know, what goes on in their little corporate board meeting. Right. Yeah, I see that. But I think that when we look at like Detroit and RoboCop 2, obviously there's been a lack of oversight at some point that got that city into a, a, a complete disaster, financial disaster and uh, safety disaster that they couldn't get themselves out of that that is clearly you know that that system of well who vote yeah we voted for the mayor and then we have these elections where 30 percent of the people vote and that's like a great turnout and so because you get 16 you know you get 15.9 percent of the people to vote for candidate a and you know somehow that mandate is any better than the old man running the show i mean it starts to become marginal at that point and now a brief word from our sponsors well, within the context of the film, too, we have to somewhat under like OCP is not really doing anything to try to help the situation. In a lot of ways, they're like they're trying to make it worse, right? So they're presented as being like the solution, right? And I think I was I sent you something that I was writing, uh, and it's kind of funny because the, the OCP, in a sense, they make the they make the problem worse, and then they come in, they go like, "Oh, look, we can fix this," right? Uh, which is kind of like a lot of what goes on now with the there's a problem that was created by let's just say like a, a company or the government or what have you right and those same people come and be like hey look we have a way to fix this problem it just so happens to benefit us you know almost 100 percent, right well it gets really like you know kind of repeated throughout history you know what i mean so yeah, within that context, but like I, I, str I thought of this when I was, like you pointed out, like this, and I think I've mentioned this to you when we were talking about it, especially at the end of the second film, I go, I mean, the old man makes a convincing argument and I go, I mean, can Delta City be any worse than what Detroit is right now? Um, you know, as you, a viewer of the film, you're supposed to think like, no, 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 we don't want OCP to win because they're kind of viewed as the bad guys, right? And the... But they're not the bad guys in like the traditional sense. They're kind of like the bad guys in the background, right? They're not Kane. They're not um, Clarence, who uh, is like the main drug lord in the first one. Uh, they're like the kind of they're like the bad guys in the background, right? Was, um, and then you know, obviously, uh, we should, probably should have said this at the beginning. But if you haven't seen the film, you know, don't listen. <laughs> I mean, I think that's the very essence of the movie is. Yeah, they're making Detroit worse, OCP, but it was already bad to begin with. And maybe, you know, maybe they're the, you know, OCP is trying to push that last domino over. 
but there's a serious problem to begin with. And is, I, I mean, obviously OCP is evil. They're coming up with the Ed 209 and the other ones that are like mass murdering robots that were really made for military purposes. And that's kind of like the, you know, that's the trope of a movie like this, I think. Like you've got to kind of, you know, set that aside a little bit because I mean, they, it's still an 80s action movie. Yeah, and they're trying to make it for just a general audience who just want to enjoy the movie without having to really think too much of all this other context, right? Things getting shot up and everything. So I think there's probably definitely things they could have explored more with, you know, what got Detroit to that point. They really don't explain it. I think that you would know if you had watched it in the 80s that there was definitely a malaise coming on. And they had talked about... um you know, things that I'd read about it of the Reaganomics and it's kind of like, you know, and I don't think that that particular angle aged very well, if that's what they were really going for, um, because that is so particular to that time and place. But I think that a lot of movies at that time period had this idea of a uber wealthy class that had everything and then a underclass that was incomplete that was completely destitute and you didn't see that theme for a long time in movies and in just in popular culture and i think that idea is coming back again now and maybe that's something that when you get into bad times that's a common trope that you know it's a fear that there's going to be an uber wealthy class oh, what was that stupid one with matt damon where the rich people lived in space elysium elysium yeah that was yeah. the one yeah i thought i i hadn't watched it forever i remember i watched it the first time with like i thought some of the visuals were kind of cool but uh how would you wrap it so there was a remake of robocop in like 2014 ish which was pretty bad but if you could remake if you could remake RoboCop today, what would you what would your RoboCop look like and what would what would he act like? How would you make this movie better if in today's context? Oh, in today's context. Um I mean, I would have OCP probably be I would have probably have OCP have something to do with the internet for one, you know, so, social media. I think that would be I think that would be pretty brilliant. Uh especially in like today's context because it's just such a such a hot button issue um it would it would have been nice it would be nice to have uh it would have been nice to maybe have like the in the remake they changed the suit completely um but it would be nice to have like maybe have robocop move a little bit less like robotically i, I guess that's like, it's part of the charm of the movie but it, it is a little like kind of like uh it is a little bit kind of ridiculous, like just how like stiff he is. Um, on a side note, do you, do you know how much that suit weighed? No, eighty pounds. Wow! Took an hour and a half for Peter Weller to get put in that suit every day. He would lose three pounds every day sweating. Yeah, I think for me, the way that I would reinterpret it today is. I think, and in a way it's been done better in other movies, kind of like with um, Blade Runner, where it's an AI that has kind of hit the singularity or that it's it's become self-aware. Yeah. I think that that melding of the human and the, the robot was maybe something that they needed at that point for the technology. And that's the way they kind of explained it in the movie is that a uh, pure AI just wouldn't work. And I don't even think they use the AI, but I think that that uh, playing with like AI and that sort of role and the learning from, from the network, I think that would be a really interesting thing. And, you know, a, a cor a, like you said, with the private entity putting why would you know what do they gain out of having a robocop i th you know in in today's day and age what does it gain out and i think that that might be an interesting uh you know a, an interesting way to explore those issues i think if they had continued with the films you would start like you brought up blade runner where like the the ai and the human 
kind of like merge together right and they become like a single thing i think that was the direction that they're hinting in like it's going in like robocop slowly starts showing a little bit more of a personality like at the end of the movie he like he you know he says a line that he i um i don't think he he ever says in the movie or uh throughout the movie he said something like well we can't get them today or something like that which kind of hints that like he's slowly becoming his own thing um yeah i would have liked i would that's my one complaint about the robocop movie in general is they spend not a lot of time but they spend like a fair amount of time of like him like going back in his memories or like his old like his old life with his wife and his kid and it's just it's not it's not done very well and it's it's not really explored very well like i if you're gonna do it like i get why it's in the movie because robo camp cop can't be just a machine or the two seconds that you saw alex murphy um you have you have to feel like kind of like a certain amount of empathy for him right um which is what those scenes provide but it would have been better if they had flesh those out more right it almost seems like well we have to put this in here it we got to figure out a way to do it they never had a way that they could end that robocop's not going to go back and be uh the dad again and you know that that was a conflict that they're never going to resolve where i think that if maybe they had done something where they had melded the consciousness of the officer into a, a robot like something like that i think they could play with that a little bit more those themes of you know he wants to be human like you know once you put him into this you know he's like nine feet tall and you know he's made all made out of metal and like he walks with those servos <laughs> you know he's never going to be human again yeah and you know i don't think they ever played out those themes of like because it's impossible he's not going to be yeah. human no matter how much he thinks you know or ha you know has recall of these memories of his yeah. you know loving wife and you know a picturesque picket fence house and all that he's never getting that again and there's no way to play that out it was something like too and it's and it's we were talking about ocp it's like well, ocp just took this random cop's brain after he had been murdered and decided like you know what we're gonna put you in a metal suit and you're gonna be you're we're gonna leave enough memories in your brain that like you you understand that you at one point you were human you had a wife and kids but there's nothing you can do about it and they just don't care that they've done this it's like oh he's a product yeah i think that the thing that they kind of hinted at throughout the movie is that they were really pushing the cutting edge of technology and they weren't they had no consideration of ethics on um, what they were doing. And I think that that was something that they were trying to really push that this company was so unethical. And that's another thing that I think they could have, and maybe in a different format and not an 80s action movie where they want to see somebody get shot with a gazillion bullets and, you know, get those like humorous elements in there of companies acting unethically just to get this product out there and they don't really care that they've ruined this guy's life and you know the cops the peter weller cops life and they've also you know that they're probably completely screwing up whatever psychology is left in his brain that's another thing in the movie too and it's it, it's this sense like and i i find it myself feeling it but i find it's a more of a a general public thing it's like whereas in detroit no one seems to care about detroit like the cops don't really seem to care all that much the couple that do seem to care they're not enough to make a difference ocp does not care about detroit the government doesn't seem to care about detroit um and i'm finding like i could be off on this but i i find like in a generally speaking like when i interact with people in terms of politics or what have you right uh it seems to be a, a growing sentiment in general it's like it seems like less and less people are caring and i think that's something that robocop touched on and it's something that seems to be a theme in this podcast is seems to be happening like nowadays it's like less and less people are caring